بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في قرآنه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدا وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, MashaAllah, we are at the officializing of a nikah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering and to make this gathering where the angels shroud us with their wings, the sakina, tranquility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends upon us. The rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala envelops us and may He the Almighty make high mention of us in the seven heavens. Ameen. So first and foremost, as I am addressing myself and then the groom, and a gathering that largely or completely consists of males, I thought it all the more appropriate to base today's talk or to title today's talk as the ideal husband. The ideal husband. Because if we look in our lives, most of us, we want all of our endeavors, whatever we do in our lives, to be a success story. And especially in regard to our marriages, we want our marriages to become a success story. We don't want, none of us would wish that our marriages should hit the rocks perhaps after a few weeks or after a few months. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our marriages. But sadly, even though all of us want everything in our lives to become success stories, none of us want to adopt the life of the man whose life was a complete success story. And that is, or that was our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't want to adopt his life as our lives. For the minute we do that, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, no doubt we are going to be successful in this world as well as the hereafter. It is upon us to follow our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I wish to touch on a few tips if you will or small pieces of advices if you will which are all in accordance to the life of our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also at times derived from the words from the golden words of our beloved master muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam primarily it is of utmost importance that we be gentlemen in our relationships that we be gentlemen in our marriages You see, at times at the very inception, at the beginning of a marriage, everything is rosy, everything is sweet. We tend to be very courteous and there's a lot of chivalry. There is a lot of... We we are beautiful gentlemen. But then later on, as it goes down the line, perhaps due to a few reasons, the marriage becomes a bit stale or after a few pregnancies, we are no longer that interested in being that great a gentleman. We take things for granted. And we start being rough, being harsh. This is not from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best husband. He was the best leader. He was the best commander. He was the best teacher. He was the best role model sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was an individual unlike us. He was busy. He was shouldered with so much of responsibilities. But he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had time for his family. He had time for his loved ones. He 
He lived a life which was a beautiful example that all of us must study, learn and derive lessons from. Because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best creation to ever live on the face of this earth. So let us derive beautiful lessons from his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the incident where once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was about to undertake a journey. His wife Safiya radiallahu anha was with him. And there was this camel. As we all know, a camel is not a small animal. It is a fairly large animal. And his wife, Safiya radiallahu anha, had to climb the camel. Now you know what our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did? He went by the camel, he knelt down, and he placed his thigh, his thigh as a support for her to place her foot on and then climb onto the camel. This is from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at what a great gentleman Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. But we on the other hand, do you think it's difficult? Now no one's asking, nobody is riding camels on Marine Drive or Gold Road perhaps. We have good vehicles, mashallah. Is it difficult to go around and open the door for our wives, for our spouses? Is it difficult? But then at times, we take it a step ahead in the sense towards... The, the bad part where we at times we sit coolly in our vehicles, we come by our houses, we're not bothered to get down from our vehicles, we toot away, expecting our wives to come running from wherever they are in the house, perhaps in the midst of cooking, perhaps in the midst of looking after the children, and come running to open the gates for us. Allah Akbar. You know, if you're that lazy, then have an automated roller shutter. But if not, you should go and do it yourself. This is not being a gentleman. This is not from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The very least, at least, we look at this sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is a sunnah. He did it. And we are supposed to follow him. Now, we don't have to buy a camel and kneel down. But rather, if we have our vehicles, we are supposed to go around, open the door for our wives. This is a beautiful lesson from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We at times see the Westerners, the people of Europe doing it, than us. This is all from the lessons towards they have, uh, towards polishing yourself and becoming a gentleman. All of this is hard-coded. They have to follow it. But we, on the other hand, having a great role model in front of us, we don't follow him. So it is upon us that we be gentlemen in our relationships. The next piece of advice is to treat our spouses with the best of treatments. To treat our spouses with the best of treatments. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and please remember salawat whenever I mention his beautiful name, he is reported to have said, Khayrukum khayrukum li ahli, wa ana khayrukum li ahli. Allah Akbar. The best of you all is the one who is best to his family, i.e., his wife and his children. And I am the best from you all towards my family. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said. Beautiful words. We are supposed to treat our spouses, our families with the best of treatments. And then it is also upon us to treat our spouses gently, with love, with care. We are supposed to treat them gently like fragile vessels. Allahu Akbar. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have compared women to fragile vessels. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said along the lines of these words, Be gentle with the fragile vessels, i.e. women. Be gentle with the fragile vessels and be careful not to break them. Because after all, they are soft. They are weak. They are soft-natured. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created women. We on the other hand, we are strong. We are supposed to look after them. So we are supposed to treat them like fragile vessels. Treat them with care. Treat them with love. Treat them with gentleness. Treat them with respect. This is upon us men. We are not supposed to treat them harshly. We are not supposed to billah, beat them and throw them around. This is not from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah, our beloved master, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was sent as a mercy to this world, these are the lessons that we derive from him. We are supposed to treat our women with the best of treatments and we are supposed to treat them like fragile vessels. We should treat our spouses like precious pearls. We should treat our spouses like precious pearls. Just imagine 
you have a precious pearl with you, how would you treat that precious pearl? Would you just chuck it around somewhere and leave it? No. You would protect it. You would keep it in some place careful. Why? Because it's valuable. It's precious. Likewise, we need to treat our spouses, our women folk, our wives like precious pearls. This is from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next piece of advice, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is to greet our spouses with salams. Now this is something, this is a sunnah that is dying away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. At times we see husbands and wives finding it very, very difficult to greet one another with salams. Because this is a beautiful sunnah. If it is not brought into practice at the very inception of the marriage, you will find it difficult, even though it's not impossible, you will find it difficult to bring it about as you go down the line in the marriage. So at the very inception of the marriage, we have to make it upon us that we greet our spouses with salams and especially when entering home. When entering home, we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And furthermore, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, إِذَا فَعَلْتُمُ تَحَابَبْتُمْ أَفْشُ السَّلَامَ بَيْنَكُمْ There's something if you do it, there will be love amongst you all. Love will be put in your hearts. And what is that? Spread salam amongst yourselves. Allahu Akbar. The more you spread salam amongst yourselves, the more you say salams, love will be put in your hearts. At times we find it, people whose marriages are on rocks, they find it very difficult. You know, why is there no love amongst us, the husband and the wife? It is upon us to follow the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If not, the devil will play with us. He will run on a rampage amidst our marriages. We don't want that to happen. So let us follow the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next piece of advice is to look good and smell good for your wives. It's to look good and smell good. Once again, at the very inception of the marriage, you know, we men, we tend to look our best, well pruned, smart, you know, clean. But as it goes, a pot belly comes about and then you're no longer bothered. Your clothes are thrown all over the place as it goes along in the marriage. And we want our wives to be like actresses. We want our wives to be like actresses, but we aren't ready to be like actors if that's, the, if that's what you wish. We want to remain the way we are, but we want our wives to be like celestial maidens from Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he used to enter his house, you know what he used to do? He used to make miswak. He used to make miswak. Because he did not want to offend his family members with perhaps an offensive order if it were to emit from his mouth. Allahu Akbar. He used to make miswak often. And this is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, it is upon us too to follow this beautiful uh, example from our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next piece of advice is to thank our spouses often and sincerely. At times, we thank people who work under us, maybe the maids or the secretaries that we have under us more profusely than thanking our own partners who are more deserving of our gratitude. Allahu Akbar. You see, it's not the responsibility of our wives to wash our clothes, to cook for us, to look after our children. Nay, we should employ people to do that. It is not Sharia does not demand that from our wives. But on the other hand, they're doing all of that out of goodwill. And don't think that, oh, I am the breadwinner. I'm doing so much. I'm going from morning to evening. I'm earning so much of money. My dear brother, rizq has been written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are nothing but carriers of that sustenance. That's it. But on the other hand, whatever our wives are doing for us, it is out of their own goodwill. It is out of their own goodwill. So it is upon us to thank them to respect them, to love them for what they are doing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, مَن لَمْ يَشْكُرِ النَّاسَ لَمْ يَشْكُرِ اللَّهِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, along the lines of these words, that the one who does not thank people, 
has not thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we cannot thank people, then we aren't thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us thank our spouses. Let us appreciate whatever they do for us. Let us not undermine those tiny little things that they do for us. Or, and also let us overlook those small faults and small mistakes. Because these are all from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next piece of advice is expressions of love. Expressions of love. We should express our love often to our spouses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created women in such a way that they always feel emotionally insecure. They need a lot of emotional security. We, on the other hand, we have been created as logical creations by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think, you know, I go in the morning, I'm doing all of that, I'm slaving from morning to evening. For whom? For my wife, for my children. So naturally, these are all, we think that what we are doing is manifesting our love. But no, more than all of that, if we were to come back home in the evening and say, darling, I love you, that would mean the world to her. But at times, we, because we are busy, we are busy with all different things, we forget to do that, resulting in them becoming hurt. This is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many a time we see how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very beautiful words he used to converse with Aisha radiallahu anha. The next piece of advice is to use sweet expressions. I say this often. Whenever I get the chance to address a crowd before a nikah, before the officializing of a nikah, I touch on this. Because this is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something that is also dying away. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to address his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha using fond names. Ya Aish. Oh, ya Humaira. Now, Humaira was not the name of Aisha radiallahu anha. He used to call her Humaira. What Humaira means is, O oh, rosy cheeked one. O oh, rosy cheeked one. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest of prophets, the seal of the prophets, Allahu Akbar. A person who has been shouldered with so much of responsibilities, if he has time to call his wife so sweetly, why can't we? And there is no harm. We can call them using sweet names. We can call them, we can invent names. Sugar, cupcake, honey, sweetie. All names that will bring about love in their hearts. These are all from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let us do in accordance with the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because at times, I don't know whether it's in Kalambo, but then in the outskirts of Kalambo, you see people, if you have relations there, you see them addressing one another using pronouns. You see them? Addressing one another using pronouns. Inanga or awanga or this and that. You know, pronouns. So your wife is just a pronoun. That's it. Your husband is just a pronoun. That's it. A pronoun. Rather, why can't you manifest your love by saying something sweet? That will bring about love. In accordance to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then it is also important that we let our spouses know that... In other words, we let our wives know that they are the ideal partners for us. Because like I said, they need a lot of emotional security. We don't threaten them with divorce. We don't threaten them with divorce. Some of us, illa man rahimallah, some of us have the habit, the minute an argument crops up, they threaten their spouses with divorce. You know, I will divorce you. You know what, if I divorce you, you will be on the streets. There will be no one to marry you. If I go out, there are so many women to marry, but you will have no one. They threaten them with divorce. This brings, you know, this drives a wedge in between the beautiful bond of marriage. We should stay away from that. Rather, we should say beautiful expressions of love which will secure that marriage and concrete that marriage. The next piece of advice is to gift one another things. And let us not restrict it to Valentine's Day or the birthday. These are all paganic cultures. And it is not becoming of a Muslim to celebrate birthdays. Nor is it becoming of a Muslim to celebrate Valentine's Day. No. If you want to gift, you gift on the two Eid. Because these are the two festivals that is prescribed upon us Muslims. We only have two festivals. Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. Or else just randomly, just randomly gift something. This brings about love. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Tahadaw tahabu. Gift one another, you will love one another. Gift one another, you will love one another. It doesn't have to be expensive things. It does not have to be branded items. It does not have to be a Louis Vuitton handbag which will cost around $2,000. No, a small token of appreciation, a small gesture of love 
Just a tiny flower perhaps, something small, which will win their hearts, resulting in that marriage blossoming and in, in, in love filling in that marriage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of our marriages. The next piece of advice is to help our spouses, help our wives with their household chores. This is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's involvement at home. And then she went on to say something along the lines of these words that he used to help at home by stitching his own clothes, washing his own clothes, cleaning the place. This was Rasulullah. Once again, like I said in the beginning, the prophet, the greatest prophet, he was the commander. He had so much of responsibilities upon him, but he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had time to spend at home. We, on the other hand, are we prophets? Are we shouldered with such great responsibilities? Why can't we spend time with our families? Why can't we spend time helping them? At times we even find it difficult to lift the plate from the dining table to the sink. Allahu Akbar. This is not from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We expect our wives to do everything, even to serve the curry and the food for us. No, let us try and help them out. Let, them, let us help them in their day-to-day -day household chores, making their task easier for them. The next piece of advice is to praise your spouse to her relatives. Some people, once again, ilama rahimallah, have the bad habit of talking bad about their partners to their own family members. Say if he has a chance to sit with her cousin brother or her uncle or her aunt or the mother-in-law or whoever it may be, they start talking bad about their wives. You know, her cooking is like this, she's, from morning to evening she sleeps, she does this, she does that. We start nagging, we start nitpicking, we complain. This is not from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't do that. We don't do that. We, on the other hand, we praise her to her relatives. We praise her. We talk good about her. This is what we should be doing in a beautiful marriage. And the next piece of advice to encourage her to keep good relations with her family. We should encourage her. We should advise her to, to maintain good family ties with her family members and her relations. And the next piece of advice, and this is in regard to arguments. I don't wish to scare the groom, but arguments are inevitable. Arguments are inevitable. They are like the waves in the sea. They come and they go. It is upon us to just surf over those waves and keep continuing on our journey. Arguments are inevitable, but how do we get around these arguments? Do we blow those things out of proportion? Do we brew thunderstorms in teacups? What do we do? Do we start nitpicking on tiny little things and blow them out of proportion? And at times, Allah forbid, those things are the things that later on result in a divorce or in a separation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our marriages. We need to understand that, um, that you see a marriage, the relationship, the bond of marriage is not only about love. This is the mistake many people make. They think that marriage is all about love and the minute love decreases a bit, then the marriage is out of the window. Marriage is not only about love. Marriage is about love, yes. And then it is about understanding. It is about compromise. It is about sacrifice. It is about patience. It is about mercy. These are the other factors that make marriage complete. So we need to understand that even if an argument crops up, what we need to understand is for an argument to go full flow, you need to have two people. You need to have two people. There's just one person talking and the other keeping quiet. An argument cannot continue. An argument cannot continue. So, what the two spouses need to understand is if an argument crops up and if the husband is angry, the wife needs to calm herself. If the, on the other hand, if the wife is angry for something, then the husband needs to calm himself down. He needs to perhaps make ablution because we need to understand that anger is from the devil. Anger is from shaitan. Anger is from shaitan. So let us try to change our postures, perhaps drink a cup of water, get up, sit down, make some ablution. Seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the accursed devil. And most important of all, let us bear patience. Because at the end of the day, we need to understand that marriage is a beautiful bond. Marriage is a beautiful bond that has been sealed off in the heavens. It has been sealed off, it has been decreed in the heavens. And who was the matchmaker? The matchmaker was none other than our beloved maker, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And marriages begin from this dunya and they are supposed to last for an eternity. Our bonds of marriage have to traverse even onto the next world. So we need to think broadly. We need to think very broadly 
The minute we start thinking like that, we will bring about patience. Now let me share with you all a story and then I'll wrap it up. There was once a lady who was married to a man who had a very short fuse. He had a very short fuse. He used to get angry for every little thing. Say perhaps the sugar is a bit less in the tea, he used to blow his top. Maybe if there was a little too much of oil in the curry, he used to blow his top. For every little thing, and he started nitpicking, he was getting angry for every little thing. But the wife loved him a lot. She loved him very dearly. But what was happening is that she was finding it difficult to maintain the relationship because he was like a volcano. For every little thing, he was blowing his top and he was losing his temper. But she loved him dearly and at times the friction was so much that it almost resulted many a time in them separating, in, in, in divorce. So one day, she was thinking what to do and then she hears about a lady, a lady who's well versed in magic who's well versed in magic, she, she knew the art of making love potions. So this lady, she wanted her husband to love her. So she goes to this lady and she tells the lady about the story. And then she tells her, I want a love potion. I want a love potion so that I can mix it in my husband's food. And the minute he drinks it, he'll be, in, he'll be madly in love with me. And then my problem is solved. There will be no more. Volcano bursts, there will be no more uh, anger to be worried about. So can you please make this love portion for me? I'll pay you whatever the price you want. The lady says, no problem, I can make you the love portion. But then there's just one small issue. To complete the love portion, I need an ingredient that is not easy to get. And that is the whisker of a tiger. It is the whisker of a tiger, one whisker of a tiger. Now this is a story with a moral to it, yeah? I need that whisker of a tiger. If you can get me that, I'll make you the potion and gift. So now the lady is wondering, how am I to get the whisker of a tiger? Then this other lady tells her, you know, in this particular jungle, there is a tiger. There is a tiger living in a particular cave. Why don't you go and try and get the whisker? The minute you get me the whisker, I'll make you the potion. Now this lady, she feels hopeless. She goes back home and she's wondering, how on earth am I to get a whisker of a tiger? A tiger. It's a cat, it's fine, but a tiger. She keeps thinking and a few months go by because each morning she gets up and she determines, okay, I'm going to go get the whisker of the tiger. She, gets, she steps out of her house and then she realizes, oh my God, it's a tiger. I can't deal with the tiger and she comes back inside. So this went on for a few weeks until finally she plucked up some courage and she goes up to the jungle just to check on the tiger. And then as she comes close to the jungle, she hears a deafening roar. The tiger roars from the cave. She runs back home. So gradually she started strengthening herself. She started strengthening herself until finally she made it to the mouth of the cave. And then the first day she witnesses the tiger. She witnesses the tiger in all its glory and she runs away again. Now she decides the only way I can get to this tiger is perhaps by feeding some food. So she started staying out of the mouth of the cave and throwing food every day, every single day. So gradually the tiger started to get used to this routine and started to warm up to her until finally she could make her way into the cave. And now she used to feed him close to the cave but still throwing the food. And now it, it developed further this relationship between the woman and the tiger until finally she could go up to the tiger and feed him. Now so far so good but now plucking a whisker is not easy. Now plucking a whisker is going to be tough. So finally it developed so much that now she started to sit by the tiger, pat the tiger on the head and give the tiger the food to eat. Now she's plucking up her courage to pluck that whisker. And she was, because she's worried now the minute she plucks the whisker, if, he, if the tiger gets angry, the tiger is going to have her for a meal. So finally one day she realizes, now I think the tiger is tame enough and she takes the the, 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 the jump, you know, the risk, and she plucks the whisker. The tiger was calm. The tiger didn't even feel it. She was so happy. But this process almost took about a year or two. And now she holds the prized possession in her hand, the tiger's whisker, and she runs. She runs to that lady and says, Lady, I got your ingredient. I got the tiger's whisker. Now make me the potion for me. Then that lady says, My dear sister, you don't need a potion. You tamed a wild tiger. Why can't you tame your husband? You don't need a potion. 
with patience, with hard work, you tamed a tiger, a wild tiger in the jungle. Why on earth can't you tame your husband? This is a lesson. It applies for both sides, for both partners, for both spouses, whether it be the husband or the wife. That we handle things smoothly, beautifully, with patience, resulting in all of those arguments is falling into bits. The minute we look back after an argument, we'll think, oh, it was such a petty issue. It was such a petty issue. At times you ask people who have now divorced, you go and ask them, do you regret? They'll say, of course I regret. They lost their children, they lost the happiness of that marriage, of that house. The, the, the house is in shatters, their home is, in sh the, the, their home is no longer a home, the children have been brought up in such a way that they're torn apart between the two parents. So the, when they think about it afterwards, they regret. They think, you know, we fought over just some petty issue. So let us be patient, let us understand, let us sacrifice, let us compromise, resulting in our marriages becoming very, very strong and also resulting in our marriages traveling from this world onto the next, onto the akhirah, where we will reside in eternal and perpetual bliss. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins. May He the Almighty accept our good deeds. May He alleviate the sufferings of the Muslim ummah, especially our brethren in Gaza. May He reward them, may He accept the shuhada from them, and may He grant them high stations in Jannah for the trials and calamities that they are going through. And may He the Almighty bless this bond of nikah that is about to take place in a few minutes. May He bless the two spouses. May May He fill their hearts with pure love for one another and may He the Almighty bless them with beautiful, obedient children who will be a coolness to their eyes and may He the Almighty protect all of our marriages too and may He accept our good deeds and just as how He united us here this beautiful evening may He the Almighty unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam